Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Oh, uh, well, it's Monday again. Thank goodness. It is. We made it. We made it through the weekend. That's right. Rain and all. That's right. Do you believe all the rain will get you? Yeah, and here we are again. Yeah, Armando said something about that last week about it turning all rainy and fun stuff like that. Which is okay. You know, we're going into fall. It's going to start raining. It's, gonna, it's supposedly going to get cooler, though, if you look at the long term forecast, they're saying that we're going to have an unusually warm fall and that it's actually not going to get uh, start dropping in temperature till probably early December at this point. But the but the farmers almanac is saying that they're going to have one of the unusual colder winters this yeah. year. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. now, well, they were saying that too. It's it's going to be delayed, but the temperatures, uh, particularly in the east, are going to be colder than usual. Something to look forward to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you know. I mean, if it does start later, maybe it will end sooner. Maybe, maybe it will be cold, but maybe it won't be cold, you know, forever. So, I don't well, know. We'll see. The, the, the Earth rotates. The axis tilts. Mm -hmm. As long as that keeps happening, we will have changes in the weather. Yes. Amen. <laughs> yeah. That's fine. Yeah, I, actually, you know, I've... I've come rather accustomed to to the weather in Atlanta and Atlanta is not, you know, out of all the places that I could be, you know, Atlanta is not, you know, a bad place, you know, nope. weather-wise. Now, I could be in Monterey. Now, that would be, to me, I, either in Monterey, Italy, somewhere in the Mediterranean, that would be perfect for me, you know, because it never gets really cold. It never gets really hot. It's always kind of in the middle. And that's kind of what I'm used to. You know, that's what I grew up with. So when I was in the Navy. I spent uh, almost a year in San Diego uh, between trips to the Far East. And um, the, the nights are cold. I mean, they can get really, really bitter in San Diego. And then the daytime temperature is, can get quite warm when there's a Santa Ana. And then they look at, you look at the average mean temperature and it, it sounds like it's an ideal place uh, to, to live. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. However, the extremes uh, create a mean that, uh, that uh, uh, the extremes are kind of uncomfortable. Yeah. I remember standing brow watch in, 30 degree temperature uh, <laughs> and it's damp there in, in San Diego. I mean, right. so there you go. Yeah. Well, see, Monterey is kind of unique in the sense that it gets the exact same kind of weather 365 days a year. You're going to get a little of everything. So you know it's going to get down to 40 degrees. Now, it will never get below 40 but it will get to 40. But 40 when the fog is in and it's really damp and everything else can feel pretty cold. Um, but you, you know, if you're, if you're a resident in that area, you just learn to dress for it. So you wear layers and you know, you, you start off the day with a bunch of layers and as the day goes on, you take the layers off. And then as the day ends, you put the layers back on, <laughs> you know? And that's a that's a three hundred and sixty five day a year thing there. So it just is what it is. So you know, here in Atlanta, it's it's like I said, I've gotten used to it, and in many ways, I like it. You know, I like I actually kind of I prefer warm weather, not hot. So anyway, hey, Armando. Hi, Veronica. Hello. We got John. Hi. We got Bernard. Hello. 
Hey, hey, uh, 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 Bob, you, do, you, do you take jokes? Because you were talking about when you were a, were a baby in San Diego. How do you remember what happened when you were a baby? He wasn't a baby. He was, he was in the Navy. Did you get that, Armando? Navy. I understand baby. I said, what? Navy, yeah, not Navy. baby. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, those times when you were <laughs> a bad guy. That's right. A bad guy? Yeah. How was he a bad guy? I don't, yeah. You know. Hey, Veronica. Good morning, Armando. How are you? Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Oh, that's true. Here, having it stop raining every day, I'll be on and off with that. A few drops stop later on the morning, a few drops stop. So I don't know what's going on with the Mother Nature. Anybody of you can tell me. Well, it's to keep us from burning down. Mm -hmm. This is still hot like hell. Yeah. Well, look at it this way, Armando. You know, mm -hmm. this is not unusual for this time of year. Okay. Oh. I mean, we are just entering fall, and usually fall gets a little wet, stays a little wet, mm -hmm. okay? and, it, and normally it starts cooling off, though Bob, Bob and I were just talking about that, and uh, the prediction is that it's really not going to start dropping temperature until, you know, early December at this point. Oh. Oh. So it's... Thursday morning is supposed to be about 50 degrees. Is oh, it? that's good. <laughs> this week? Yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah. Well, 50 is not, you know, not That's really, nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 50 is not really yeah. out, of, out of range. Now, is it supposed to no. stay? Is it supposed to stay 50 all day? or? Well, the, in this up to the 70s, uh, Thursday and Friday are supposed to be beautiful fall days. Okay. Nice. Yeah. So if you're going out painting, go on, plan Thursday and Friday. <laughs> well, we'll try to do that. Hmm. <laughs> All right, so let's see. There's really only four of us, four of you guys and me, okay? But it is okay. time, and we're going to get- Bernice was here. Yeah? Well, yeah, she went away. Where did she go? Yeah, I don't well, know. Wanda's here. Maybe her connection. Wanda's coming, yeah. Yeah, okay. Hopefully Bernice will get back. Okay. All right. So I got a whole bunch of stuff to share with you guys today. Okay. And, uh, okay. Good. Oh, to us. Yeah. Um, how many of you were here on Friday? Most of you, right? Except yep. for yep. Yep. I got your pictures, the face. Yeah. I'm going to practice doing faces. Okay. Yeah. Well, over the weekend, Oh, oh wow. wow! What does a mask? Yeah. No, it's it's made out of styrofoam. Okay. You carved oh. it? I did. Okay. I did. Oh yeah. You know, just you know, with a utility knife and and two blocks of styrofoam that I glued together, I carved out you know a, a basic shape for a head. Okay. And everybody kind of remember. You know, the circle that's, you know, two thirds, you know, of the, well, you're supposed to divide this, you know, from the center line up into, you know, basically, you know, two sections and then it's supposed to be equal at the top, create, you know, three, you know, a whole. Um, you know, this is a little bit short up here, you know, maybe it could be just a little bit taller you know, by just a little bit. Uh, but overall, I mean, it's close. It's close in proportion. Uh, but it turned out, you know, really pretty well. Really? There, you know, but here, there's the actual three-dimensional thing, you know. And I brought that with me just so I could show Bernice, because I told her I was going to do that. But I'll, I'll actually share the photos with you. Now, you know, it's always nice to do stuff like that you know, little aids and tools, because if you're going to be drawing a lot of heads and faces, you know, you, once you have kind of like a three-dimensional model like that, it's very easy then to take it 
and to light it. Can everybody see uh, oh, that? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you can take it and you can light it. And I, I didn't put any like real extreme light on it. But I just shot it, you know, in the studio with the regular lights on. Um, but even at that, you know, you can begin to see, you know, sort of the, <clears throat> how the planes break down into light and shadow. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you, you can get a pretty good idea as to how that's going to work. And let's, you know, let's just say that you're drawing somebody's head, right? And you don't understand or you can't see the lighting very clearly. You could always use this, you know, uh, maquette to basically light it and get a good understanding of what's going on in their face. And then you'll know what to look for, you know, looking for those changes in value. There you go. And while I was doing this, you know, I kept thinking of lady, <laughs> you know, cause she's, you know, she's always working with, Mm. You know, like a lot of three-dimensional sort of materials. She, she, she abandoned us. Well, I don't know that she's abandoned us. You know, she's got she's got stuff going on in her life too. You know, but you see, you know, just just having this, you know, you can really begin to see it. And what I'm trying to do, you know is I'm trying to get you to understand, you know, if you understand this basic form and how to kind of create it and, and the proportions in it, then you can draw almost anybody's face, you know, and get it, you know, get it proportional and get it, you know, feeling like the, the actual features like the eyes and the mouth and nose and ears and things are actually attached and part of it rather than just kind of floating on a flat shape. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody got anything to say about that? Uh, it's, a, it's actually a good idea because I I tried doing that with the face that I made uh, with a woman with flowers around her head, mm -hmm. and uh, I just got on, so I, I enjoyed it. Hey, Bernice, how you doing? <laughs> I missed the little lecture you you just had. Okay, well I'll I'll kind of go over it slightly again. Okay, okay. remember on Friday okay. I, I I told everybody I I'll get a a couple of blocks of foam and I'll make, you know, a model of a head. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I did. So this is just two blocks of styrofoam that I glued together. Well, actually three because the nose is a separate piece that I, I cut and I glued in. Oh, there. okay. But notice the circle on the side of the head. Mm -hmm. And then of course, mm -hmm. you know, the outside edge is the bigger circle, right? Mm -hmm. And then we've added on, you know, that lower jaw area and, and kind of filled in the face. So, you know, it, this probably took me about, probably about four to five hours. Time, oh. You know, to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I took about four or five hours. Now, all I did so far is I've just used the light in the studio. I haven't lit it, you know, with a directional light, really. But even, mm -hmm. even with that, you can begin to see some of the changes in value on, on how mm -hmm. the different planes move in different directions. Mm -hmm. See, like this is the one like where she's looking up. Right. Right.
So it becomes, you know, a, a really pretty handy tool, you know, right. to have to have around. Oh, I, oh, I, I see. I, I see where you boot the back of the head on too. Well, that yeah, that was all part of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You mean about the baby pup chamber? Say what? You you that you <laughs> holding the head in the baby pup chamber? Oh, this? No, that's a that's a little cup for mineral spirits and stuff. Oh, I thought it was a baby pup chamber. No, it's way too small for that. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a tiny little cup. Yeah. Oh, okay. Back. That's the back. Mm -hmm. They don't and make those anymore. Pardon? They don't make those in the, anymore, those things, those middle things. They don't make it anymore. Okay. I don't know. I, I picked up like three of them. Uh, where did I get that at? I think I got it at binders or something like that. Binders? They're metal. You know, they're like an enamel. Yeah. With, uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. But they're great, you know. I mean, you know, they travel well, you know, they're sturdy. They don't break. They don't break. <laughs> you know, you got them, you got them forever, you know. Mm -hmm. And they don't rust either because of the enamel surface on the inside and the outside. Okay. But well, notice. That, that, there, are, there are a few enamel pot sets that come with a very tiny little, uh, 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 what you call, little uh, pot like that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. It's a very tiny little pot, you know. Yeah. I guess it, you know, the heat show. I don't know what it's for, really, but I, but I've seen those, you know, the little pot sets, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you know, I've got my, I've got my inner circle, right? And then I, right. it's not exactly centered, you know. I'm running a little bit hot. I actually probably need okay. to lower that for hours. <laughs> but still, you can, you know, you can see the planes and how they change, you know, fairly clearly you know, on this. And, um, you know, and so in a drawing exercise, if you don't understand what somebody's head is actually doing, uh, you, you could always take and set this up and light it, you know, to get to light and shadows that you want. Mm -hmm. Guys, when you say light it, what do you mean? Um, use like a, like a one directional light to create like stronger light and shadows. So you can see where the shadows would fall on those planes. And that way you can translate it. Let's say that you're doing a portrait of somebody, but you don't like the lighting because it's real flat. And so you want to enhance it in some way and you want to push the values a little bit. You could use this model, you could light it, right? Get the lighting the way you want on it. And then, you know, basically transfer that information onto the, the face that you're drawing. Oh, okay. I and, thought you and, were talking about illuminating it. I see now. Well, you, yeah, you would be. You no, would, no. Would be. no, I thought you meant like something was on the inside illuminating. Oh, I, oh. I got you now. Okay. No, no, no. It would have to be on the outside. Yeah. 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 But let's say that we wanted like this is lit from really the upper left, right? Mm -hmm. Is where the light's coming from. Well, we could yeah. move that light. If we move that light, then the shadows are going to change on that form, right? Yeah. You know, to something maybe, you know, more like that. Right, right. Okay. See, so you can, you can clearly see that you're going to have to look for like a cast shadow from the, from the bridge of the nose. Um, the whole side plane of the face is going to be in what we would consider, you know, fairly deep shadow. And then you're going to get transitional values, you know, through that transitional plane from the side plane to the front plane. Uh, where on the other side, the left side of the face, you know, you really aren't going to get a lot of, you know, a lot of contrast or variation in value because all of this is lit up, you know, quite a bit. So, you know, you could apply that to, you know, basically any face that you're drawing. You yeah, know, when I did my lady with their face, I wish I had a thought about doing a nose like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
well, this... just uh, more or less uh, press in on the foam to shape the nose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But this is even better. Yeah. Well, I cut. Yeah, I cut it. It's a it's a mm -hmm. separate piece. Okay. See, and I I cut this wedge mm -hmm. to kind of fit the profile here. Oh, okay. See, mm -hmm. and then I glued it in, and I took a you know just a straight finishing nail, a very long one, and then mm -hmm. you know put it right through the point of the nose. You know, just hold it in place until oh, the glue set yes. up to dry. Mm -hmm. You know. Oh, okay. So, but anyway. So that was that was about five hours of my weekend, you know. <laughs> five hours, you know. Yeah, yeah. But you know, I mean, now it's a good model. It's a good model, that's for sure. Right. Yeah. yeah I, I wish I wish we had a, vi 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 a video of you doing it. Tell you the truth, so <laughs> I could know. So I could know uh, where if I want to make one for myself. Uh -huh. uh, well, you know how to put it back to look. I kind of can see that you went right through the eyes and put a circle. Yeah, you know, that's that's one piece in the bottom of the second piece. Yeah, well, now, what, I'm guessing what you've got here is you've got two fairly good sized blocks of foam mm -hmm. that I started off, and they you know, they were just square, and I oh, okay. glued, I glued the two of them together, and, and the line you see, like right across here. Mm -hmm. That's where I glued the two blocks together. There was one down below. Right. See, both of these were, you know, cubes. You know, oh, okay. one above. I, 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 I was assuming they were circles, but go ahead. Mm -mm. No, mm -hmm. no, they, it was, it, started, uh -huh. it mm -hmm. started off as a big cube. Okay. Is what I glued up. And then, you know, I let that dry. Mm -hmm. And then after I, it set up and it dried so that those two blocks wouldn't come apart, then I started carving and I okay. used a, a utility knife, you know, one of these knives that have like the multiple blades that you break off, but mm -hmm. it's like real long. I just extended it out. So I had a nice long blade and just very gently, I started, you know, kind of sawing and cutting off and shaving off, you know, parts of those foam blocks until I shaped it into, you know, basically what you're seeing. Um, Charles, but, could you lift it up in your, would you lift your head up again so I could see the size in your hand? Oh, uh, well, yeah, I'd have to stop. Oh, no, we can see you on the screen. Just, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, I see. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's almost life size. Yeah, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty much so. It is life size. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. So. And that was two blocks, one on top and one on the bottom. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, I can't remember where those came from. Mm -hmm. I'm one of these people, I don't throw stuff away. And, <laughs> you know, particularly like styrofoam, you know, packing materials, yeah. things like that. Mm -hmm. you, you never know, you know, you know when, you, when you can use that stuff, um, you know, to make something. And we all do that right. when yeah. we get old. Yeah. Mine yeah. was a wig, a wig a holder. The whole week. Yeah, yeah. The I thing, use that one. Yeah, the thing but like about the, those being able to put a nose on like that was good. Uh huh. Yeah, the thing about those are that you know they're molded. Yes. <clears throat> but none of those molds. I haven't seen any of those that are really proportionally representational of an actual human head. They're kind mm -hmm. of stylized, you know. Um, you know, but again, you know it. Even that, you know, that won't give you the contrast in the light and shadows because the planes don't change radically enough to be like a real head. You know, it's all kind of soft. Yeah, and, especially if you're not using it for something like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you're trying to use it, let's say that you're doing a portrait of somebody. And, and like what I was suggesting is where you, let's say you have a photograph of somebody, but the lighting is flat and just kind of very uninteresting, right? And so you want to enhance the lighting. You could take a model like this, set it up, get it to be the same orientation as, as the reference photo, and then photograph it with the lighting that you want. And then you can transfer the shadows over to the face you're drawing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and make it a much more interesting 
uh, you know, drawing of the person and, and have yeah. something that's going to give you some pretty accurate value ranges, you know, just, mm -hmm. just with that. So it, it becomes a useful tool in that sense. And, you know, for my five hours that I took out of my weekend to go do that, you know, I think that was a worthwhile project. You know, mm -hmm. it helped me, you know, I certainly learned a lot, you know, doing it. Now, if I really wanted to get like super ambitious. Um, it, it, uh, it makes us think you, you care about us. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's good because I do. <laughs> um, but let's say that I wanted to get super ambitious, you know, and that I wanted to do a sculpture, an actual sculpture. Uh, and let's say that I wanted to do that sculpture out of plaster. This is a great beginning. Yeah. See, because I can build a form like that, and then I can coat this in plaster and then carve back into the plaster mm -hmm. to make an actual, you know, plaster sculpture. And it keeps it lightweight. See, because it's not solid plaster. So instead of weighing like 40 pounds, it would weigh, you know, maybe like six or eight pounds. You know, but if you if you put a three quarter to an inch thick coat of plaster over this, and then carve back into it, you you could do a very nice sculpture that way. And would that I've done hold this. up to make a mold? Pardon? Would that hold up to make a mold? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Depending on the type of mold that you wanted to make, I mean, after you had the plaster on it, yeah, you could certainly make. Yeah, you could certainly make a clay mold out of it. And in fact, you know, that's why you would make a, uh, you know, a plaster uh, original, because then you could do a two, two or multi-part mold uh, from that in clay. You know, and, uh, you know, and get a, get a good result that way so in fact I've done figurative sculptures that way where I've done like a foam core you know armature with maybe a wire running through it to hold the foam core together and then worked plaster on the outside of it and then carved back into it uh, to make the final you know the final plaster model and then done you know molds from that you know, to do pourings. So you could pour your pieces in clay and then, uh, you know, have them hollow so that they're, you know, not solid blocks of clay as well. So, but, you know, working That's three dimensions. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to our ceramics class starting back up again because that was a lot of fun doing that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, working in clay is fun, you know. It, and, and it gets your brain to kind of thinking a little bit differently too, mm -hmm. because, you know, it, where you're, when you're drawing, you're always trying to visualize the thing that you're drawing, you know, as a three dimensional form, right? Working, you know, either carving, you know, or, or hand building or, you know, working three dimensionally, you know, you have to, you have to really work with it and think of it in a very different thing because you are working with a three-dimensional material. So you really got to get used to working, you know, 360 degrees all the way around this thing. Um, and it's, it's a challenge, you know, it is. So, mm -hmm. anyway. wow, we got a bunch of people now. We got a whole 13 of us. <laughs> Yay. Okay. Anyway, so, uh, you know, now that we got 13 people here, I'm going to move forward, and uh, but that's that's what I did with that. Uh, you know, I, I promised you guys I was going to do a uh, sculpted three-dimensional head, so I did that, and uh, I'm going to share one more thing, and then we're going to jump into looking at a couple of different artists, and uh, then we're going to listen to a short segment of a video uh, from an artist by the name of Carlos Santos. Uh, who I thought had some really good things to do, you know, to say. Uh, great artist, you know, really, really good portrait artist and, and you know, figurative artist. Uh, but 
you know, he was talking about becoming an artist and, you know, kind of how he got to where he was. And, and I think some of that information is really inspiring and also useful to even us, right? Even though we're a little bit old, okay? So anyway, I'm gonna share, let's see, where is it? Okay, yeah. Um, this is another thing I did with my weekend. This is uh, actually a painting that I'm, I'm currently working on. And again, you know, I started this painting because I wanted okay. to demonstrate, you know, how to do a, a tree without a lot of leaves on it. <laughs> and that kind of grew into this painting, you know, from a little walk that I had along uh, Nickajack Creek. And, uh, and so I started developing this painting. Uh, you know, while I was out there walking in the middle of the creek, you know, up and down. I took some photography and I did, I did a few sketches and thumbnail drawings and stuff while I was out there. Um, it was, this was about two miles down the trail. And, and that was further than I wanted to carry a paint box and all my equipment and stuff. So I just worked with the photography and the drawings that I did. Um, Anyway, I'm developing this, so it's it's in progress. But uh, and you know, it's I'm not finished with this yet. You know, the uh, the tree that I'm trying to uh, give you guys a little insight into how to paint trees without having to paint every tree branch. So, but that's that's you know, this is kind of where I'm at now. Now, if you remember earlier, I basically just had a shape. It was kind of a gray shape here. And I, I created a gradation where it was darker here and a little bit darker to the edge and the light was really kind of right in this area. Because I'm thinking of it, you know, as a form. I'm not thinking of it as individual tree branches. I'm thinking of it as what's the overall shape of it. And really it's, it's kind of a ball, right? And so I want to kind of create that, that underlying range of value and color, you know, in that kind of ball shape. And I want it to feel dimensional. Once I have that, you know, then I start kind of breaking it up with some of the bigger tree branches. And I'll come back in and I'll define some of these a little bit more. And then the final stage of this is I'll come back over it with uh, like a a gray, kind of a medium gray, kind of maybe a little bit brown, and just dry brush, you know, to kind of create this broken uh, layer of paint that you'll still see some of the branches and stuff through. And when, when I do that, then it should look a lot like an old dead tree, you know, or a tree that's dormant without any leaves all over it. And, uh, and, and then I'll, I'll be done with that part of it. Of course, I've taken on a lot more now, you know, because I'm doing a whole, you know, a whole landscape. But, uh, you know, this is where it's at right now. And I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. It's beginning to look like water and you can see where things are, are, are at. Uh, pretty much so the background, all of this area back here. It's pretty much so complete, you know, and I'm really kind of working in the mid ground right now. And, uh, and I just started developing, you know, some of the foreground. So, but I thought I would kind of give you an update on that one too. Anyway. Thanks. Any questions about that? Thoughts? No. I, I think like where you're going with it. Yeah, I, th I think I showed you guys, you know, the early stages of that, you know, how I began to block it in and stuff. Um, so, all right, so let's see. Uh, where is your Adrian sign, that's right. Okay, so I wanna start off, there's three artists that I wanna show you today. And, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for all of these artists. And actually two of them are connected in life uh, because they are now man and wife. They married each other. 
And uh, I'm going to start off with the why first. Uh, she's a very young woman. She was born in 1986, or was it 89? Yeah, I think it's like 89, okay, is when she was born. Um, and her name is Adrian Stein. Now, to be as young as she is, uh, she's been A, a prolific painter, um, you know, got a lot of recognition very, very early on uh, in her life, you know, as, as being uh, somebody to really watch over time. But she's also been a very successful businesswoman. Um, because along with her, her art that she creates, uh, and I think everybody can kind of see this woman with the red flowers, right? Mm -hmm. That's a paint. That's a painting. That's a painting. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah it is. It's gorgeous. Uh, and she does some amazing work. And the thing is, all of her paintings are really complicated, you know, very, very layered, nuanced, uh, complicated compositions uh, mm -hmm. and beautifully done. You know, and, and, to, and to be. Does, uh, does, uh, does the hand on the right look a little big? No, not really. Oh, it's just about right. yeah. okay. Well, the hands, you know, your hands are as big as your head. Oh, okay. You know, if you if you put your hand up next to your head, it's basically about mm -hmm. the same size. Yeah, and okay. your hand starts here, by the way, that that crease in your wrist out to your mm -hmm. fingertip. It should be about the same height as your head. And if you go finger to finger, it should be about the same width as your face. Okay. So, okay. so hands are a lot bigger than people often draw or paint them. You know. And, you know, uh, they vary with people. You know, some people have bigger hands, some people have smaller hands. You know, some are a little, I mean, some are like me. And, and it looks like my hands were designed in a foundry or something, kind of industrial, because they're real thick and, you know, they're not real long and elegant looking. And then you have other people who have these very graceful looking long hands and very kind of thin fingers and stuff. You, you get a lot of variation. But uh, the thing with uh, this young woman, and so she was born, let's, let's, you know, 89 was when she was born. So 90, so she's a little over 30, okay? And to be a little over 30 and to have accomplished some of the things that she's accomplished in her life is really pretty incredible, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's, it's nothing short of amazing. Um, she's done literally, I think, thousands of these paintings now. And as I said, you know, they're, they're not simple little paintings. I mean, they're complicated, you know, and they've got a lot of elements of like flowers and drapery, the flesh tones, the figures, you know, um, and just amazing, amazing type stuff okay and uh just really beautiful work what is what is the artist's name adrian adrian stein s-t-e-i-n okay okay and uh she's been featured i think in well a whole variety of art magazines but you know she's a, a figurative painter and um trying to remember i don't i don't think i've ever seen her i'm sure she probably has um but i i don't think i've ever seen her do a male figure i think it's all women right and they're all these they her work kind of reminds me a little bit of the matthews uh, from California and the, the California Colors Movement. And they were back in the 1800s. And, and her, her work is, is more vivid and bold in many ways than theirs, but 
she she kind of goes along with the same almost you know classical theme you know mythology things like that but look at the use of color you know i mean these very warm sort of reflected lights you know against these very cool you know direct lights and you know it, it's like okay you know we, we talk about the color of flesh right you know whose skin is green right but does it matter see you still read it as a figure and and in fact you know, the skin can look green if you have the right light on it. You know, it, it will get kind of greenish color. Or blue or purple or anything else. Now, this particular flower, I've I'm becoming very familiar with, okay? And this is a lily, and it's called a cahaba lily. And the reason it's called a cahaba lily is that it only grows uh, along the uh, Cahaba River Basin in Alabama. But interestingly oh. enough, she's used the blossom from it, but then she's used the leaf from some other kind of plant. I'm not sure what that is. But, you know, these have a more lily-like leaf, which is very long. Uh, but the flower is, is definitely that same, you know, that same flower. Yeah, I thought it was a big morning glory. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, Charles, she only paints women's? She only paints what? Women's? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember her ever painting the male figure. Nothing that I've seen. Now, I wouldn't. I wouldn't make a a brash statement that she doesn't. I just haven't seen anything so far. Uh -huh. yeah. But the thing I like about her work is uh, really the dramatic lighting. You know, the light and shadow. You know, the way she uses color in the flesh tones, and how how she kind of layers everything. You know, in her paintings. Uh -huh. um, you know, as I said, they're like really complicated. I mean, none of these were like, well, I'm just going to sit down and do a painting today. <laughs> you know, these, you know, these are very well thought out, very well designed and planned. You know, there's nothing in these that's really by accident or by chance. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's all pretty intentional. He loves nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there, you know, I mean. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Nice pictures, yeah. Yeah, look at the uh, transparency in the fabric. Mm -hmm. You know, how you see the skin tones coming through, you know, the sheer fabric. You know, I gave, uh, I, I, you know, I gave our, our painting class at Benson, I gave them a project like this where I had a model come in and you know she had some sheer drapery around her and you know stuff like that is really a challenge you know it's mm -hmm. it, it takes a little bit of time to figure out how to do that you know and make that how work. would how would you do that how would you do that uh well yeah actually about five or six different ways you could get there okay in, in her case I think she's using a combination of, you know, more or less traditional painting process where she's doing a complete underpainting and then she's using glazes. Uh, you could do, um, you could do it where you actually paint the figure and then, you know, build up the fabric over it, leaving areas open or broken, as we would say. Uh, to let the flesh tones come through you could do that with you know more you know a little a little more solid opaque paint um if you wanted to you could do it that way 
Um, you could do it where you paint the figure and then you just build up glazes, you know, to build up the, uh, the fabric over it. So there's, there's different ways of getting there. None of them would be fast. Okay. You know, none of them is, you know, I'm just going to sit down and, you know, paint a, you know, paint a piece of drapery and there's going to be a leg under it, you know, and I can see the leg. So. But, you know, I, I love her work, you know. I really do, you know, just, I, and I love the way she uses color. Her color actually <laughs> reminds me of, of a friend of mine who is now no longer alive, and his name was uh, Kazu Sano. And uh, Kazu and I went to school together at the Academy of Art, and Kazu was very successful. Um, ended up doing a lot of work in uh, like Hollywood and LA doing a lot of movie posters and stuff like that. But her, her color sensibility is a lot like his, you know? And it's just, it's just you know, beautiful use of color. And, and control, you know, really just wonderful control over value, intensity, temperature. Mm -hmm. And like I said, you know, I mean, you know, this, this is a very young woman. She's only 30 years old, you know? It, it takes a lot of professional artists, you know, in, into their 40s and 50s before they're painting at a level like this and, and seeing the degree of subtlety, you know, that, that she's capturing in her painting. And the thing is, you know, if, if you look at her, uh, you know, look at her painting, in a way, it's like she's, she's simplifying, you know, she's simplifying a lot of the ranges of value and the gradations and things, you know, and really just kind of putting in just what she needs to, you know, to get the effect that she wants and, and keeping it still very simplified. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Busy. Yeah. yeah. Busy. Bugs. Flowers. Transparency. <laughs> you know, wild, you know, pink hair. You know. This is a beautiful painting. I love this. I love this painting just because the transition of the skin tones and all the color. The purples, the reds, the oranges, and yellows, and greens, violets, everything's in there. Yeah. And it, literally everything. How, uh, large, would, how large did she work? Uh, actually, pretty good size. Um, most of these, I would say they're probably like 20 by 30, 30 by 40. You know, she's not doing so. so they're, they're they're full size human heads, basically. Yeah. Most of them. Yeah. 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 The figures, uh, the figures in a lot of these are pretty close to life size. So. Is this charcoal? Um, I'm kind of guessing it could be. It could be charcoal. Could be Conte. Okay. Yeah, but look at the look at the range of value she gets. See, to create that form, you know, we talk about, you know, you need those five at least five values to turn that form right. So let's look. Okay, so you get this deeper shadow, and then you get this transitional tone, you know, into the light, and you get a little bit of a core shadow, like right along here. If you notice, you squint your eye down, how dark it gets. It's almost like a crescent moon shape right here, right? And then it kind of repeats down here in the jawline. So there's her kind of core shadow, you know, into kind of a transitional tone, into the light and highlight right here, light over here, 
you know, and then back into mid-tone and shadow on the other side. Again, you know, just really, really beautiful use of color. You know, the design, you know, the composition. And the way, you know, the way she layers paint. Look how thick and opaque this paint is. You know, and then you look back here in the background. She's got a lot of paint on here, you know. She's not being stingy with anything, you know. She, she's, <laughs> she's slapping some paint on that thing. But look at the difference of this area, which is, you know, very kind of muted, grayed down. And then as she moves forward and she gets this, you know, these tree limbs to move forward, why? Why do those come forward and the others sit back? Anybody got any insight into that? The values. Values? What else? What else other than value? I guess they're moving forward so she can highlight the head, the woman's head too. Can yeah, but more that you look at her head. Okay. Well, color and intensity. Ah, yes. Intensity, and there's one more. Contrast. Well, yeah, there's five types of contrast. We've named two of them. What's the third one that she's using here to move? You know these uh, these tree trunks forward and keeping these in the background. Size and color. Huh? Size, size of the of the leaves. Well, okay, scale, yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah, the the thickness of the the tree branches. Okay, I wasn't really thinking about that one, but that yeah, that works too. All right, so there's the one thickness more. Thickness of her leaves. Her leaves are very thick, also. Okay. Yeah, but we're not really talking about the leaves. We're talking about these tree trunks right here. John, say color. Or detail. Well, we've, yeah. well, okay, but what about the color? Well, John, John say that when he said, he said two things. Yeah. So it's more, more colors versus yes. Cool. temperature. Yes. <laughs> temperature. See, these are cooler tend to recede. These, even though they're dark, they're considerably warmer than these. And so they move forward. Okay. So that, you know, the, that five, you know, those five types of contrast, that's no joke. You know, I mean, if you learn that stuff, if you, if you really begin to kind of think about that stuff, you can really use it in your paintings and it makes an enormous difference, you know, by just grasping those concepts of the five types and it of seem, It seems the branches being so strong would bring your focus to her face because her face is right under the, mm -hmm. the branches. Yeah. So it brings your focus to that part of the picture. Right. Yeah. Which is what she wanted to do, you know, because, she doesn't want you looking in the background, you know, that it is the background, right? Where she wants you looking is, you know, this is the hero right here, okay? And if you look in this area, you've got the strongest value contrast, right? You know, some of the lightest lights against some of the darkest darks. You've got the most extreme temperature contrast these very warm leaves against all of this, you know, this very kind of muted and dark in the background, right? You've got intensity, right? All of this is very grayed down and muted. All of this is pretty intense, you know? The, the, the flesh tones, the reds, the pinks, the, even the violets in there that yellow, you know, a lot more intense than any of this back here. Yeah. 
and of course, we have edges, okay? All of the edges along here are, they're not like real, real sharp. She doesn't make a lot of really sharp edges in her uh, paintings uh, for the most part. I mean, occasionally, like right here, that's like one of the sharpest edges in the whole painting, just the back of her neckline. You know, everything else, it just, you know, it's knocked back just a little bit, including these guys. You know, the edges along the, the edge of those tree limbs, you know, she softened them just a bit so that they don't compete with, you know, the focal point right here. Mm. So, so again, you know, she's, you know, she's taking the time. She's really kind of thought through all of this and planned it out quite well. Uh, here's a, I think this is a, a blast from the past for her. I think this is one of her very early paintings, you know, before she got into painting the, the female figures, she was uh, starting to do landscapes. And that's where she is today. So as a painter, I mean, she's, <laughs> She's really come, you know, like a, a long way. There she is. And Bob, I, or somebody was asking about the size of her paintings. So, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Very young. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, she's just a little over 30. You know? What is the price range of her paintings, do you know? Uh, about eighteen to twenty thousand. That's why she's smiling. <laughs> she's got something to smile about. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I mean, if I were if I were doing work like that, I I'd be smiling too. You know, she has. Uh, how, how how did she become so famous? And others, you know, maybe similar caliber. You never hear of or never do anything. Well, oh, gee, uh, oh. <laughs> well, it depends on your agent. Well, it's, I think, you know, she, you know, she worked really hard, you know, and became a very, very good painter. She studied uh, with people like Richard Schmid, uh, Dan Green, went out to the West Coast, studied out there, uh, went down to the Southwest to the, I think the Fetchin. I mean, she's been around. You know, and she, she put in a lot of time studying and working. And, um, you know, a couple of good galleries picked up her work initially. And she's very, very good at promoting herself as well. And, and then eventually she opened her own gallery and, uh, and ran that, you know, pretty successfully. And she's still painting. And to add to her accomplishments, if none of that was enough, Somewhere along the line, she met another artist who uh, is another phenomenal artist whose work we're going to look at. And his name is Quang Ho. And Quang comes from Vietnam. Um, you know, he came here in the 60s as a child, grew up in the U.S., and uh, has become just, you know, a phenomenal painter. And I, th I think you're really going to like his work. We're going to look at him. And the, now Quang... Quang is around a little bit younger than me. Uh, he's like right at 60 and she's right at 30 and they just had their first child together this year. So yeah, they married each other, I think two or three years ago. Yeah, it's not a very good uh, reproduction of this, but I really, you know, I really like this painting, you know, for a fairly simple subject. Um, you know, just if, if we had a good reproduction of this, you know, you could see the way she used the color and all the feathers and stuff. It was pretty, pretty amazing. Mm. Yeah, there she is in her studio. 
I can kill when I cook it. Make oh, you want to cook a goose? Oh yes, I cook it. <laughs> yeah, I like I like I cook a, a really good goose actually. But <laughs> you know this this gives you an idea of the scale mm -hmm. of her work. Yeah. So you know she's not working like small. Yeah, they are big. Yeah. yeah, and if you notice, I mean, if you if you scale the proportion of the figure to her being life size, right? Then most of the heads and things are actually above life size. You know, they're bigger. In, 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 initially, I thought that purple purple painting was a was a mirror of her. When I when I looked at it real fast, I thought, oh, okay, she's in her mirror. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of her ends up in the painting. You know, mm. they they say that about artists. You know, anytime we paint anybody, we always put ourselves in there. So. Mm. Now here's here's one to knock your socks off too. Uh, I was hoping the focus on this would be a little bit better, but you know, trying to paint, you know, flowers like that, not easy. But you can definitely see Richard Schmidt's influence in you. <laughs> yeah, I mean that that could be a Richard Schmidt painting. It really could. <laughs> yeah, the technique and everything. So so much. There you go, poppies, and again, you know, the transparency of the fabric. Yeah. Are you guys sick of looking at her work yet? She's beautiful. Yeah, have you had enough? You, you surrendered? <laughs> <laughs> Please move on. I can't take any more. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. So let's talk about flesh tones. You know, how many turquoise, you know, people have you met in your life? So, a couple of Martians, but that's the only ones yeah. I can remember. Yeah, but it works. You see, and 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 you know, just think about this for a little bit. Look at the color that she's got in the background. It's very dark, right? But it's mm -hmm. very, very cold blue. And then you introduce this, you know, blue-green, turquoise, right? In, in a range of value. And then you kind of accent and highlight it with these warmer sort of cool reds, you know, these pinks. And then you take it up just a little bit more. And you shift that cool red into something that's warmer, right around the lips of the nose right there. See, And it's those little subtle temperature shifts that make all the difference in the world and make you go really right there. That's the purple. Okay. But she's playing with color. She's playing with temperature and value and intensity. You know? And she really manages and juggles them really, really nicely. So. And then uh, I love this painting. This is so reminiscent of one of the paintings that uh, John Singer Sargent did with the children in the backyard with these uh, Chinese lanterns here. You know, but how you know she got the sort of glow of the lanterns, you know, on the skin, you know, just really beautifully done. I see the light coming up under her hand, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, on her. amazing, yeah, right in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The, I, was, I was thinking that it might have been a little cast shadow, but because of her arm and her hand, but I guess not. Well, there is actually. Uh, look at the dark here in the fold. Let's see. It's getting darker because there's no light, you know, getting into that area. Right now. So, but yeah, she's, you know, 
you love to hate her. You know, <laughs> you know she's she's so damn good. She's an expert in uh, the folds and the chiffon like oh, yeah. material. Well, yeah, just just you know, I mean, expert. yeah, she's mastered pretty much all of it. You know, skin tones, yes. florals, drapery. You know, I mean, I don't think there's anything really she can't paint. Uh, you know, she's she's got, you know, kind of a full gamut there. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, so let's let's continue the tour and um, let's make everybody feel even worse than they do now. And uh, I'm going to introduce you to her husband. Uh, his name is uh, Quang Ho, as I said. Uh, you know, he's from Vietnam, came here as a child, uh, grew up, you know, a, a good portion of his life in the United States. I think he came here maybe as a, you know, maybe as a teenager or something like that. And this is his, you know, some of his work. I don't want to blow this up. And contrast the style. You know, she's very controlled, you know, very kind of shape and form oriented. You know, his paintings are very active, you know, a little more, you know, I see a little more Richard Schmid in his work than I do hers. Um, just with the loose brushwork. But again, really really masterful control of value uh edges you know uh color as far as the intensity um he plays with temperature he doesn't do it quite the same way that she does see kind of makes you you know kind of makes you wonder what the kid's gonna be like when um I think when I think it's a little boy, you know, when, when he grows up and, and he becomes a painter, there's no way he can't be, <laughs> okay? <laughs> you know, he's got two parents who are both not only nationally recognized artists, internationally recognized artists, and this kid is going to, you know, grow up and not be an artist? I don't think yeah. so. Yeah. That ain't going to happen. So, uh, Not yeah. unless he's a real rebel. Kids love to reject what their parents do. Yeah, I know, but you know, the art thing, I mean, you know, he's getting it genetically from both of them. Now, I mean, you know, it, it's like, yeah, probably not going to happen. You know, it's kind of like my son. You know, his, he, you know, I, I'm an artist, his mother's an artist. And, you know, he, he doesn't work as an artist, but he's very artistic, <laughs> you know. I mean, he really is. He's got just a lot of natural talent if he ever really wanted to develop it, you know. Now, he would rather play with fish instead. And, uh, you know, that's, that's his thing, you know. Mm -hmm. but, but he kind of got that from me, too, because I'm very much so on the science side of things. And I love science. And so, you know. He decided to go that direction. That was great. But yeah, I think Genet it was, pardon? Genetics are a real thing. Um, my parents divorced and I didn't meet my dad until I was 21. And by the time I met him, we had the same um, dancing compulsion and we danced the same way. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was strange. You know, genetics do play a factor. Yeah, well, you got a lot of your bio mechanics from him, probably. So, yeah. But you know, Bob Ross, the painter, his son kind of rebelled until the very end about painting like his father. Yeah, but now his son is painting these days. I know he went back, he, he rebelled till after his father died, and he as he had to paint. <laughs> And well, it was very good therapy for him, also. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, you know, they try to take everything away from his father. Right. Well, they they pretty much so successfully did. 
Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, um, but you know, he he decided to not to have any hard feelings about those people and decided to go on with his life and continue right. the pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it it took him a while, you know, to kind of get over. Yeah, I bet it did. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's moving forward. You know, he seems to be doing good in life. You know? And he paints like his dad too. He does. Yeah, he does. <laughs> Yeah, you, you can. That's what you, that's what you call it, a real theft of intellectual property. Oh, mm -hmm. absolutely. For sure, yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that nurse really had something to do with that, too. That's why he, she got him to marry her. She probably was a friend of those people. No, I. Because she's, she's the one that gave them the, the authorization to do all that stuff. Well, she did, but, you know, in, in her defense, you know, there was a lot of legal pressure on her. I mean, yeah. they were threatening her nonstop with legal action and messing up her life, you know, in many, many ways. And she just kind of decided, you know, it's yeah. it's really not worth it, <laughs> you know. And she never got with the son thinking about his life, the legacy his dad was leaving him. Well, I, I you know, I don't, I don't know all of the intricacies of it, but... He doesn't seem to have a lot of animosity toward her. I think I think he understood what was going on there, and uh, you know, I mean, I, it doesn't make it easy, but I I think he understood. Yeah. And, you know, he's he's moving on. So yeah, he is. He is. You know, unfortunately, things like that happen. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. You yes. know, not not everybody out there is. You know. Good people going going to treat you well. <laughs> mm -hmm. You would think they would at least give them something, you know. Tell me about it. Well, they would give them a, a single dime. Yeah, that's that's not the way. Those people of that kind of frame of mind don't work that way. Yeah, you know, it's 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 all or nothing. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. So, and there's never going to be enough. So, mm -hmm. um, anyway, back to what we're talking about. You know, as, as a study, and um, you know, he's he's doing a lot of horses right now. I don't, you know, uh, don't have to but uh, you know, beautiful, you know, paintings of horses. You know, interesting studies and interpretations. What he's really known for, though, is his landscapes, and uh, I'll show you some of those in a little bit. We're getting down to them. This is one of his paintings. But again, Can you, you know, give us his name again? Yeah, Quang Ho. Q U A N G Ho. H O. Quang Ho. Thank you. Find him. You know. Quang Ho. It's easy to find him. Armando, you're missing the show. No, I love him. We got a naked what? woman in the pool. Yeah. <laughs> you talking to me? <laughs> a no, blurred no. naked woman. Yeah. Now, his woman is different from his wife, Adrian's woman in the water. Maybe oh, yeah. his yeah. wife. A lot different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that that's Adrian. Like, around in the pool. No. Well, hers is more uh, traditional. Oh yeah, their approach. Oh, yeah, that that is is yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, Quang's work tends to be more active, you know, mm -hmm. more brushstrokes. A little, you know, there's there's not a lot of illusion there. It looks like paint, it feels like paint until you back away from it, and then it becomes this thing that he's painting. Um, so he's, you know, in many ways. She's a more sort of traditional process mm -hmm. painter, and yes. he's a more contemporary a la prima painter. But still, you know, the use of, the way they control color and value, you know, it's those five types of contrast. And they're, you know, they're, they have very different looks to their work, and yet at the same time, you know, they've, they've mastered those five types of contrast, probably better than you know almost anybody out there. 
And, you know, they, it's like, it's just become part of them now. You know, it's kind of part of their DNA and it just comes out in the painting. And the only way you get there is you got to throw a lot of paint up there. You know, over and over and over again. And you learn. But, you know, like, <clears throat> I love this paint. You know, it's, it's, you can tell what it is. It's cooked, you know, he's sitting there cooking. And do you see his face? No, there's no features or anything there. And he doesn't need, need to. You know, he said everything he wanted to say. You know, he, you know, you get this sense of, it's like you're looking through something, like almost like a glass, you know, window or something into the kitchen. And these guys are moving around as fast as they can, you know, you know, basically cooking, you know, this food. But again, you know, it's, so it's, it's this, it's a very contemporary painting, you know, and yet at the time, it works, you know, it's, it's still representational. So it's like, how much detail do you really need? You know, how, how representation, how clean do those edges have to be? And the answer is they don't, you know, they don't have to be, you know, you can be very painterly, very loose, you know, very interpretive with your work and still do beautiful work. You know, I wish some of these images were bigger, higher resolution. So do you think because he is more representational and is not as uh, mm -hmm. uh, detailed as his wife, that she, he can paint far more paintings than she can because of the t amount of time? You know, that's a good question. <laughs> I mean, you know, both of them are very prolific. You know, they do, they've both done a huge amount of work. Um, now the thing with Quang is, you know, Adrian works on a, you know, a, a, we'd say it's kind of a medium to large scale. Quang works on an extra large format. None of these paintings, well, I don't, I mean, some of the studies may be smaller, but for the most part, when I, when I saw his work at the Booth Museum, he and Scott Christensen had a joint show up there. These paintings were monumental. I mean, they were big. We're talking eight, 10 feet across and high. They're not small. Now, a figure study like this, I didn't see any of those. It, it was mainly a landscape painting or a landscape show between the two of those guys. And they didn't have any figures. You know, this may be, you know, a fairly small painting. You know, when I say fairly small, maybe 18, 24, maybe 20 by 30. I don't know. I doubt seriously that this is a, like an 11 by 14 or something like that. It, it would probably have to be bigger. Yeah. And he did this whole series of like restaurant workers. Yeah. It's really, I, you know, captured, I think, you know, he captured the essence of, you know, what life is like, you know, back behind the scenes. You know, and then he does stuff like this. <laughs> yeah. Who does this remind you of? Me. <laughs> Reminds you of you? <laughs> Trying to do a lemon tree. <laughs> well, yeah, you, yeah you, you are in the middle of doing a lemon tree. Here, here's a good example of a lemon tree, okay? But who else other than Bob? Who, who else does this remind? There's a painter that we looked at not too terribly far back in the distance. The girl with the basket. Pardon? The girl with the basket and grapes hanging around. The girl with the basket. Like behind Bob. The, 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 the,
No, no, okay, no. My question, Avital, is this painting of the lemons? Mm -hmm. There's a painting, there's a painter that I introduced you to that we looked at who was a still life artist, okay? Uh, and the brushwork, the color, just the layering of the paint and stuff is so much like his. You know, anybody have any idea who that was? Anybody remember? Okay, I guess not. Um, the name I'm looking for is Hopsev Pushman. We looked at uh, we looked at his work, and uh, you know, very very similar. You know, very similar layering of color, composition. You know, I mean, this could be one of his paintings. Seriously, it really could. Very much so like his stuff. Uh, here's something that's probably a little bit on the smaller side as a study. And look how much paint is on there. Hmm. Yeah. And, you know, look at the faces and things. See, not a lot of detail. You know, there's just enough in there to kind of suggest there that there's a face on one girl. The other girl, there's almost nothing there. You know, but you see a face. And he never really painted it. You know, it's a suggestion. And it's that well, power of suggestion. I, that. I, forgot. I have problem doing faces, so maybe I can do it like just a blur thing. That's it. <laughs> right, Armando, you can you, you can use your artistic license and you can blur whatever you want, okay? As, as long as it suggests that it's there. <laughs> That's the trick. Okay. So, so when I can't paint a face, I can just kind of blur it out? Well, you could. Yeah, you could. Ooh, you know, okay. if it you works. I mean, as long as that works. Well, okay, here's a perfect example, okay? So he's got this guy sitting here, you know, he's playing a violin. Um, look at the face. Would you call that face like really detailed? No, yeah. Not really. Oh, not really. Not really. Yeah, there's a, a strong suggestion of light and shadow. You know, there's some indication of planes. There's a little bit of change in color. But, you know, he didn't paint, you know, like, look, it's a line. It's just a dark line. And then he's got a lighter area above the upper eyelid. He's got a darker area below for the lower eyelid. Okay? So it's it's very simplified. But it works. But, but, but look at all the color he has in that face, though. Uh-huh. Yeah, right. His art color is so, you know, because the shadow is coming from and all that. Mm -hmm. yeah. What what art style would you call his work? Um, I don't know that much about mm -hmm. art or art history or anything else, but is that kind yeah. of impressionistic or? Um, well, I would call him a painterly realist. Painterly realist, okay. Yeah. Uh, kind of along the line of uh, an artist like uh, Richard Schmid. Um, you know, it, it's, again, you know, it's not about detail. It's about getting the value and the, you know, the overall contrast. And the contrast is value, the you, the color, the intensity of that, the temperature of it, and then the hard and soft edges. And if you get those five things right, it's gonna work. It cannot not work. Here's Quaring. Okay. With one of his still lives behind him. So like you said, you know, he's, he's a little bit younger than I am. Not like, yeah, maybe like three, four years younger than me. 
Here's one of his uh, one of his paintings. He does a lot of these, you know, Asian markets and stuff, or did, you know, a lot of them for a while. He's moved on. He does so many different things. Now, the thing I like about Quang is that, uh, you know, his work is always changing. You know, it's always evolving. The style is all pretty much so set. Um, and he, you know, when I look at this, this is this has got Richard Schmid all over it. <laughs> you know, I mean, oh, yeah. this looks like a Richard Schmid painting. You know, I mean, the way he used the background and everything. Okay, now, Quang actually painted this here in Atlanta at uh, the Portrait Society, uh, uh, the American Portrait Society conference here in Atlanta, and uh, we've drawn and painted this woman. This is Catherine Pika. You know, she's modeled for us at Benson quite a few times. Claudia knows her. Uh, Avital knows her because she's drawn her. Let's see who else is here. I don't know that Armando ever set, set in with Catherine or not. But, uh, you know, again, you know, very Richard Schmid like. Now, just for a moment, kind of squint your eyes down you know, and look at the value structure in there and how, you know, you get this really clean division between, you know, the front side, the plane, front plane of the face being in light and then the side plane being in shadow. And notice that the shadows are warm and that the lights are cool. Cool lights, warm shadows. Okay. And always keep that in mind, that whatever your light source is, the shadows are going to be the opposite, okay? So if you have cooler light, you know, cooler colors in your light, then you're going to have warmer shadows. If you have warm light, then you have cool shadows. It's always got to be opposite. can't be the same. You can't have cool light and cool shadows. It don't work that way. Okay. Here's a still life for you. Oh. <laughs> Lorraine, are you here? <laughs> Let's see if Lorraine is. There's nothing still about that still life. No, there's nothing still about that still life. Yeah, yeah Lorraine sent, sent in some stuff. She's, she's working on a still life about her. And she had just about as many object in it, objects in it as, as this did. You know, it was a, it was a little too much. I kind of suggested that she kind of simplify it to herself. There you go. You see the figure. You know, but look at the background. You know, it's it's very sort of almost like deconstructed. It's a, it almost looks like a collage. Now, do they paint the painting and then deconstruct it? Mm, well, I mean, there's a lot of paint on there, and I, know, but I would painted? I would say I would say that he like these light areas. I don't think that's the, I don't think that's the canvas. I, I think that, you know, I mean, he's, he's put down like very heavy patches of light and dark paint. You know, after he developed the figure, he started filling in this yes. background. Okay, uh, after, he after, he developed, after he develops the figure, then does he go back and alter the figure? Uh, with different colors, values, and paint, and everything. He may go He's back. In, yeah, he may go back in and change a little bit. You know, like a temperature or something like that. Shift it a little bit. But yeah, I think once he's got the figure, you know, itself established, he probably doesn't mess with that much. It's all kind of working in the background at that point. Sure, but I think the leg is kind of too big. But with the you know, with the body, 
Really? Yeah, I think that way like it. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. You, you might like those girls with skinny legs. She's not one mm. of them. <laughs> you we know? All do. We all do. We all do? Yeah. Are you sure about that? I'm sure. <laughs> okay, you're guys. Gonna, you're gonna you're gonna speak for everybody? Okay, guys. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know about that one. Okay. I know you don't want to say anything because you don't want to lose popularity, I know. Um uh, I've no I have noticed that's not true. Yeah. <laughs> Not having skinny legs. <laughs> yeah, I've, yeah, I've I've drawn and painted a lot of models, and a lot of them don't come with skinny legs. Okay, they just don't. No, but this one in proportion to the body, I think he painted yeah. like a little bit too uh -huh. big. Yeah. Now I'm looking at this very carefully, and I would almost venture to guess that it looks like that he actually went back in and he actually took pieces of torn paper. Mm -hmm. like old drawings and things like that and actually you know put them down on the surface of the canvas you know and and adhered them with paint and then worked back over them with more layers of paint because you know just looking at these cut and torn edges in here yeah you know he's he's built up the layer layers of paint around there now i've never seen him do anything like that but that's interesting you know that that he approached it that way Nice painting. Yeah, I, like I I saw a painting like this. I'm unstable. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm I'm getting a notification. My in, my internet signal is unstable. Um. I saw I saw I think it was this painting. Up at the Booth Museum, and this is about a eight foot by eight foot paint you know and all it is is the ground with leaves autumn leaves you know and they're very very loosely painted there's a lot of palette knife in it there's lots and lots and lots of paint on here <laughs> and i mean i'm talking lots of paint on here but you know you step back from it and it just kind of all falls together and it's just leaves on the ground you know, with sunlight and shadow. And it's beautifully done. Whoop, it went away. There it is. Okay. But you know, you can take something, you can take something so simple, you know, like just looking down into the water at some of the rocks and the leaves and stuff, you know, that settled down in the bottom of a stream and make a beautiful painting out of it. You know, you don't have to have, you know, a grand landscape. You know, you don't have to have lots of color and, and stuff in, in like uh, a, a flower garden or something like that. You know, it can be very simple. It could be a row of trees like this, you know, in, in the autumn. And you can make, you know, you can find beauty in it. And that's kind of the whole point you know, of, of doing painting is you're, you're trying to capture some of what you see there. Um, you know, the beauty of that, you know, and how it makes you feel. You know, how you're responding to it. That's, that's the whole point of, you know, trying to do art like that. So anyway, so that's Quang Ho. Anybody got any thoughts about his work? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. yeah, I'm more inclined to buy something from her than him. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I thought, I thought that he's very fresh. He doesn't, he doesn't create a lot. Once he puts his coat, he likes it and he leaves it alone. Mm -hmm. And also I see is that because because of that there's some sort of feeling of mystery you want to go in and, and discover what else is there like there's a little suggestion of a hut a small 
small building there the mm -hmm. beliefs and yeah, see who lives there, how to get there. It yeah. creates some um, imagination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with you in the sense that <sighs> and I think the beauty of, of Quang's work and Richard Schmid's and painters like them <laughs> is that they don't they don't resolve everything for you you know they 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 keep it loose enough that it keeps a conversation open and you keep looking and every time you look you know there's more there um now reality is did they paint more no they actually painted less but because they painted less and they didn't futz with it it actually left a conversation open so that more of you can kind of go into that painting. You can interpret it more. It becomes more personal to you. Where with Adrian, she does beautiful work and I love her use of color yeah. and, and everything about her work is really beautiful. Mm -hmm. But there's not a lot of conversation going on. You know, it doesn't keep it open to the interpretation. You don't begin to see those things in it that second or third time looking at it uh, that you do in in like uh, Quang's work and the next painter that I'm going to show you who is Scott Christensen um, you know there's it 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 is it's kind of there's kind of a mystery to their work and it's like you enjoy seeing it and you kind of enjoy the fact that it's just amazing how loosely you know they can create an image and yet it it fall together and work the way that it does um, so it's it's a preference you know it's some people are going to like more finished things like adrian does some people are going to like more painterly things um, i liked both of them very much i like both styles very much um, um, and you do fill in the blanks on his work. You know, you do read your own image into it. Right. So yeah. that's very interesting. Yeah, and that's, you know, uh, when, you, when you start talking about the theories in painting and creating art and stuff like that, that's one of the things that are highly encouraged, you know, to stop, you know, don't finish everything because it's like the more finished you make things, the more you cut off the conversation, you know, with, with uh, the person looking at your, your work. And so, you know, there are advantages in being sort of loose and painterly in that, in that sense. Carol, uh, since you are um, a master painter, do you, do, do you, I'm not getting any sound on you, oh. Claudia. You're not? And now I am. Okay. Now, there was a, uh, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay. Uh, because you're a master painter, do you paint between both uh, <laughs> just for teaching? Uh, when uh, Do you do a lot some abstract in your personal painting? Uh, or is you still, I know you're traditional, but do you do more abstract mm -hmm. also? Stop and make suggestions, you know, just leave it like it is and, and say that's finished. Personal well, work. Yeah, I, I guess I, I approach it in my own unique way, which is I do a lot of painting from life. And in doing, in, which is, is basically what we would call an a la prima approach at first pass, okay? Mm -hmm. And when I do, when I'm working in that mode mm -hmm. then things do become more abstract they are more simplified you know the paint is looser i you know my goal my goal in that case is not the same as when i'm sitting here in a studio like the landscape that i'm painting now mm -hmm. or a portrait or something like that my goals are totally different um and my my studio work tends to look more traditional 
you know, where my, my plein air studies, life studies, things like that tend to be, you know, more painterly and looser. But that's, that's true with just about any artist. Um, you know, even Adrian's life studies and things like that are, are more in that sort of painterly style. You don't have the time, you know, you're limited by time and by, mm -hmm. you know, the light and how light changes and things like that. So you have to get something down very quickly. Um, the, I think, you know, to answer your question, yeah, so I, I do both, you know, but I do it because it's appropriate to do one at a particular time, you know, more than the other. You know, with the artist that I'm going to show you, Scott Christensen, uh, Quang Ho, Richard Schmid, Dan Green, you know, all of those artists have sort of adopted that loose painterly style, even in their finished work. You know, so there really isn't a lot of difference for them, you know, between doing a life study and a final painting. Uh, and it's, mm -hmm. it's just what they do, you know. Yeah, okay. And, you know, either one is valid, you know, either one works, um, you know, and it's, it's a, I think it's a reflection of your personality, you know. And I think with those painters who are a little looser, a little more abstract, you know, they're, they're kind of willing to take that risk, you know, of letting it be, paint, letting it look like paint where, and, and this is, this is where I'll fault myself, you know, in the fact that it's like, I haven't gotten to the point personally in my journey where I'm okay. I want it to look like the thing that I'm painting. You know, I want it, I want it to, I want to be able to see it the way I see it. Okay. And, uh, you know, and so I have a hard time leaving it alone <laughs> and I pick at it and, you know, maybe, you know, maybe after I do finally retire and I'm painting every day and I'm spending my whole day painting and stuff, maybe I'll loosen up, you know, in many ways, I hope so, you know, but if I don't, I'm okay with that too. Cause I'm, I'm okay with the way I paint. I like, I like the end result of what I get, you know, and I'm happy that way. And uh, do I need to change it? No, I don't. You know, it's, it's my way of painting. So, did that kind of answer your question? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was wondering if I was. Kind well, of I just, I just like sometimes wondering of my own when to stop. Yeah. You know? And how, can I do what uh, a queen a whole did? Can I just do something and let it go? Uh, and uh, it's kind of like I've just started to paint uh, when I at his stage, and I and when you were saying before about how artists can see with their eyes, what you see as you learn different things, and um, how you perceive an object to be, but how the eye is shaped and you look at a face, the structure much differently. So when you do that, you want to <laughs> you don't want to leave it out. I just want to paint it, then maybe go back and abstract but I really want to go ahead and paint the shape that I see and maybe do some abstract later. So, but I think they just kind of like do it as they get part of the eye, part of the eyebrow, maybe a little bit of the nose and they just move on. So um, I think that it's like English. If you know the King's English, then you can deviate from that because you know what is correct. So they probably know what's correct and they just do a little bit of that and, uh, and lead, let you, figure out the rest. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, any one of those people, if you look at their ability to draw, if you look at their ability to do finished, like highly rendered work, they can do it. You know, 
it's not a it's not a matter that they can't do it it's a matter that they choose not to do it you know because it's it's the effect that they want and and i think you know they've learned over the years um you know how to do, how to do that and and realize that there's a value in doing it that way in keeping that conversation open you know because it again it keeps us the audience more engaged in their work because we when we look at it it becomes more personal to us because we we add our own experience to it rather than have it kind of spelled out this is what it is and the light is here and this is the texture, and this is the color so it's not you know when you look at my work it's you know things are more resolved there's not as much of a conversation you know uh you know you're not really wondering about you know that piece of drapery kind of falling into a shadow and looking at other colors and things in there it's pretty much so it is what it is um and so like i said you know i i can see the value of of learning you know and i'm trying to <laughs> constantly i'm trying to learn and you know i do i do like little experiments and stuff like that um but you know when it, when i try to do that it doesn't i don't end up with anything that i feel that i'm comfortable with it it doesn't feel like me okay i guess that's the only way i can say it so but some you know paintings, i think i think some paintings uh that are finished more so it's not to ask questions but to relax and enjoy it like a a, a landscape or a mm -hmm. seascape just see it and it's finished and you can just gaze upon it and relax and enjoy it yeah rather than questions 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 i wouldn't want to be in a room with a lot of questions i just you know you're just going to get, get glaze at it you know for a minute so mm -hmm. that's okay but i don't think i want to be in a, a room surrounded by paintings that have a lot of questions that i've finished it's bad enough that the paintings talk to you when you finish right <laughs> yeah i got I, believe me i got a lot of that going on here um yeah. but you know i mean i i think at the end of the day and you know everybody's situation is different and, and i think if i would have made the a uh, different choice let's say that i was not teaching at benson okay and that i was having to rely on selling artwork uh and showing artwork uh and mm -hmm. participating in shows and things like that if if that was my life and that's what I had to rely on. Yes. Um, yeah, I might change some things. You know, I might paint differently than I do now. You know, but the reason I paint is one to keep my sanity. Uh, number two is it's just it's something I got to do. I just, you know, I, I've been doing it for so long. It's part of my life. And at the end of the day. The painting is done when I when I feel it's done, you know. And, and the goal is, I don't stop painting on something until I'm happy with it, you know. However long that is, you know. If I have to paint, if I have to take, you know, if I have to put things in and take it out ten or fifteen times, I don't care. You know, I want to get it right. I want to get it the way that I want it. You know. Um, Is there is there a time limit when you can uh, no longer correct a prop of a painting on a problem that you might have painted some time ago? Is there a time limit on uh, as far as the oil painting is when it's the uh, oil no. is uh, not really dry? No, you can always put more paint on. Okay, because I have a I have a painting that. <laughs> It, it bothers me every day I look at it that I did something so wrong. <laughs> so, and, 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 and this kind of gets down a deep rabbit hole, but I'm going to go there anyway, because it's an important question. Um, and this applies in, in 
and this, honestly, this is my advice after years and years of experience. Work on a piece. Get it to the point where you're satisfied with it, you know, at the time that you're in. And then when, when you call it done, it's done. And don't ever, ever go back to it. It's going to talk to you for the rest of your life. Every time you go down that hall, it's going to go, hey, not over here. Fix me. This is the thing right here. Yes. Yes. Fix it. And you know yes. how to fix it now. Yes. But don't do it. Oh, God. <laughs> don't do it. And, and, and the reason I say don't do it is really, uh, there's a lot of different reasons. But the main reason is, what that painting is, is it's, it's a historical document. It's a historical document of your development as an artist. And it is, you painted that painting and you did the best you could at that time. Here you are a year or two down the line and you've seen more things. You've had more experiences. You've painted more paintings. You might do it differently now, okay? Because you're not make that mistake. Yeah, yeah <laughs> make another mistake, but not that one. Yeah, you're not the same. You're not the same person you were a year ago. You've learned more. You've matured. You, you have shifted your ideas. You know the way you see life is different now than you did a year ago, with your experiences. So let it be. Let it be what it is, you know, it's, it's, it's the best you could do at that time. Now, if, if it bothers you so much that you just have to go back and prove to yourself that you can do better, repaint the painting, do another painting of it and do it better. Don't make those same mistakes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, we've, we've had all kinds of artists talk about things like that. And, you know, uh, like Casey Bow, and I, I love to use him as an example because I think he's, he's probably said it better than anybody I've ever heard, you know, um, talk about this subject, which is, you know, he's a young man, you know, he's become really, really famous. You know, his work is really known everywhere and people are just like you know falling over themselves about his work you know and he does beautiful work but he will tell you emphatically look you're only seeing like the very best of what I done and to get there I maybe did that drawing or that painting 15 or 20 times and you're only seeing the best one. You're not seeing the, the eight or 10 failures that I had to get there. And I think that is as honest as anybody I've ever heard talk about, you know, uh, working as a professional artist. You know, I mean, you know, it, it's happened to me and, you know, I gladly admit the fact you know, I've started paintings, and at the end of the day, it's not working right. And I take a palette knife and I scrape it all off. Join the club. And I'll just rub out the board and I'll walk away and I'll be angry and go have a beer and sit out on the back porch and steam and see <laughs> for a while. You know. Join the club. And then I'll get up, you know, the next day or whatever, and I'll go back at it and I'll try it again. You know. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes I don't even get through a full day. Sometimes I'll get through 15 minutes and, and I just know, you know, that the paint's not going down the way I want it to, you know, it's not working the way I want to. And you just got to kind of rub it out and walk away. <laughs> you know? And there are days like that, you know, yeah. you never know, you don't, you know, so. But, gotta go. Huh? Gotta go. You gotta go? Uh-huh. There's, there's another there's another artist that, uh, that I don't know if she talked about it, but she certainly demonstrated it. it was uh -huh. Georgia O'Keeffe something yeah. that she didn't like? She burned. Oh, yeah. She she would not let the public see it, and she'd burn it. 
Well, have, have all of you heard about the story about, you know, Claude Monet? Which story? Oh, when he was painting those landscapes and he, 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 on those panels, he just went completely uh, destroyed it all, just took it all out. Well, not only that, um, he was, it was probably only about three years before he died. He literally took, you know, a couple of thousand paintings out of his studio, them. piled them all up and burned every one of them. Yes, yes, yes. And people were like, <laughs> you know, it's like, why did you do that? <laughs> you know? I mean, you just burned literally hundreds of mil. you know, even back then, it was hundreds of millions of dollars worth of artwork. And he just looked at it and said, I don't want anybody to ever see these. I want, I want them to remember me, you know, for the paintings that I've left. You know? You know, I think I think that's as valid an idea as any other. You know, it's it's like Casey Bow. It's like he's not he's not going to send uh, a piece of work that he feels is less than he can do or inferior to a publisher to have that published in a national magazine. It's just not going to happen. You know, he's only going to send his best work, the thing that he feels best represents him. So, yeah, I think there's something okay with that, you know. I do too. But, but the thing is, again, you know, keep in mind, you know, that's not his first attempt. See? And, and I think this is the failing of a lot of people who just want to paint for pleasure. You know, you paint something you know, you're going to paint it one time and you're done. You're not going to, you know, you're, you're not going to be as invested in it or invested enough into it where you're going to go back and, and try to paint it eight or 10 times and change things about it and play with it and manipulate it to make it as perfect as you can really make. And I'll, I'll guarantee you, you know, if, if you're five or six paintings into it, the way that you view that painting and, and how you're going to approach it is going to be totally different than the first time you did it. Because you're going to learn things along the way. You must, A, it's going to take you about half as long to paint, and then you're going to do it better. Because you, you're going to know what you, what you can put in, what you can leave out at that point. So, so there, you know, I mean, and this, this is the way that, you know, most professional artists work. You know, they don't do things one time. They don't just, you know, they're not there and they're just like, boom, I have a masterpiece. No, the masterpiece is the eighth or tenth try at it, you know, further down the line. They've worked all that stuff out. They know what they're doing. They, they have a very clear intention now, you know, of exactly what they're going to do. And they're, that's what they're going to do. And nothing is going to, you know, get them off track at that point because they're invested in so heavily so anyway um we could keep rambling on forever <laughs> we could talk about this subject from now until next year but it is now 11 53 i i had another artist i was going to introduce you to but i'm not going to do that i'll save him maybe for you know maybe for wednesday We'll talk about him. Um, we'll look at his work. But in the meantime, some of you have sent in your drawings. Some of you haven't, um, if you would. Yeah. Send them in. Uh, or anything else that you're working on, anything you want to talk about, anything you have questions about. You know, if you have a piece that, uh, you know, there's, there's a little something, you know, that, that you can't quite figure out or you want some feedback on, send it in. Okay. We're, we're a fairly nice, friendly group, you know, we're very supportive wow. and we'll always try to give you, you know, good advice. So, all right. Even Armando will. 
-hmm. whether he's had lunch at Benson or not. <laughs> anyway, thank you all for coming. I erased the menu. <laughs> the cafeteria is open again at Benson. It is. Yeah, yeah. Just just for you got to go in, and pick it up, and leave. You can't sit and eat. Yeah. No. Yeah, but it's not worth it. I wish they charge a little bit more and do a little better job. <laughs> okay. Oh well. Oh well. <laughs> well. All right, everybody. I'll anyway. see y'all tomorrow afternoon. All right. Anyway, thank you all for coming. It was good seeing all 14 of you. And uh, we will oh, good. see you tomorrow. Okay, okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 B